Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to another edition of the best DFS show that just happens to start around 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six on all the main sites. This is the rotopros.com EPL breakdown for Saturday, February 9th, 2019. Uh, it's looking like a pretty ugly slate, unfortunately. There isn't a lot of ton of home favorites that we're going to get to choose from this slate, unfortunately. But uh, that being said, this is still a slate to break down. There is still lots of stands and takes to be had. So let's break through this uh, as we usually do. Let's start with the schedule. The first game of the slate, we have West Ham uh, traveling to Crystal Palace, which is uh, just across uh, London there uh, for a London Derby. In the second game, we have Arsenal traveling to Huddersfield. Uh, we have Bournemouth traveling to Liverpool, which is going to be a really interesting game. Cardiff uh, making the trip down to Southampton. Everton traveling into London to play Watford. And the final game of the slate, the late hammer, a little bit different looking late hammer slate game. We have Burnley traveling down all the way across country down to play Brighton on the south coast. So let's jump right into this first game of the slate. We have West Ham and Crystal Palace. So this is actually a really interesting game in the first game where we're able to take a really serious stand on a potential outcome. And it's going to really set you apart from a lot of different people in either formats. Now, the stand is that this game is most likely going to finish with no more than two total goals, which should make it one of the more low scoring goals of the entire slate. Uh, lo excuse me, lowest scoring games of the entire slate. Uh, so uh, a lot of this has to do with the fact that Crystal Palace home games this season still uh, haven't seen 20 total goals across their 12 total home games this season. So uh, by all definition, they've kept basically, especially in London derbies, they've kept games really close Crystal Palace has so uh, it really wouldn't it really wouldn't surprise me to see this game and very low scoring very close uh, one nothing one one uh, def like a two one uh, would be too many goals uh, it, it would uh, most likely be a one 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 nothing uh, maybe even a two nothing win uh, the hope is for Crystal Palace but really to break this down you can go with either keeper in this situation because if we're taking a stand that this is going to be a low scoring game and West Ham hasn't scored in three straight away games they've been brutal scoring goals in general have been very good in general Crystal Palace has been much better at this point of the season, but they still aren't uh, so prolifically massive with goal totals that they're going to break a slate. They all have significant floors, and what they do is if they catch any amount of goals from those floors, they really take off. And that's kind of where we're looking at Crystal Palace. The slate is the floor place first. Uh, but we can start with West Ham. Uh, basically, the only place you really want to target West Ham this slate is the defensive chase. And the main reason for that is, one, if we're assuming this is going to be a low scoring then by low scoring game then by default uh, the keepers have a higher chance of being inf involved in a successful script or the second way we can look at this is if it's a low scoring game there isn't going to be offensive ceilings to be had therefore there's going to be defensive now this could very easily like I said end 1-1 and absolutely nobody finds a ceiling anywhere uh, except again for a lot of uh, Crystal Palace players now that's the main issue with uh, West Ham is that most of them don't have the necessary floors to really carry them from these salaries. Uh, Cresswell is someone who should be getting double digits, but he's lucky to get half that. Uh, it, the same can be said for Fleet Anderson at nearly 8K. We need a little bit more than uh, this kind of inconsistent floating around just getting double digits. Like we need a like a previous Ryan Frazier impression where he was getting 15 to 70 points as a floor every single game. That's the kind of thing you want from 8K in a slate like this, especially for something like cash. Now, uh, it, it's tough to say because they should have a little bit more uh, solid minutes with all their injuries up front. Uh, we should get one 90 minute guy at least here, but it's just why chase these ceilings when it's not necessarily viable. On top of all that, when we consider Crystal Palace home games are incredibly low scoring, uh, there's just no real reason to do this when we know it's still going to be half decently owned because it's West Ham. Uh, so in, in a lot of ways you could say the same for Crystal Palace, except they don't really that's what keeps popping up if anyone wants to know uh what that looks like uh yeah that's a when my DraftKings. i need to log out and log back in because it doesn't recognize my ip anymore 
Um, welcome to Canada. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of the uh, the West Ham, they just don't have the necessary floor to really benefit from that one goal max. Where Crystal Palace, the set the same can't be said at all. Where they all have excellent floors and they don't necessarily find the ceiling, especially at home where there's only one or two goals max to be had. Uh, so as a whole, I think at the back here, you can definitely look at someone like Guida, um at only 5.2K, has an excellent chance to a clean sheet. West Ham hasn't scored in three straight uh, away games. And on top of that, um, in, in general, we can expect that this is going to be a low scoring game. So he has a really excellent shot to be in a successful script this slate from a non overly not expensive uh, keeper salary and should draw minimal ownership. Uh, and on top of that, he has two excellent excellent stacking wing back options in both Van Anholt and Juan Binsaka. You can roll with either of these guys in cash. I'd prefer Juan Binsaka in cash and Van, Van uh, excuse me, Van Anholt in GPP or take off three in the clean sheet chase. Um, another thing about Watford is that they're going to be crossing the ball a lot. Excuse me, Watford. Uh, that's true too. So we'll get back to Everton later. But uh, one of the things about West Ham is that they're going to be crossing the ball a lot. Uh, so we can expect Crystal Palace center backs to draw a fair amount of clearances. So on a site like FanDuel, I think they have a little bit, uh, a little bit of an uptick this slate, which uh, the same can be said to Everton. But we'll get there in a little bit. Uh, so yeah. In terms of Crystal Palace, again, going forward, you could really pick off any of the, the three names here, and they're absolutely fine. Um, Townsend, you can roll with in either format, though his salary makes it a little bit tougher in GPP to be over-relevant. I would rather keep him in cash. I think Milicevic makes sense for if for uh, GPP. I would like to use him in cash, but again, his salary is just a little bit too high, and I'm not sure how uh, consistent, sustainable that can be. Uh, especially with Zaha coming back. And just it, that, that doesn't necessarily mean Zaha is going to take a bunch of the set pieces or crosses. But what it does mean is that a lot of it does come out of other people's feet and into uh, Zaha's uh, opportunity creation. Uh, so uh, obviously I think Zaha is the better play of the trio at only 7.5k. I don't necessarily look at him as cash viable, though his production has definitely been good enough. Uh, I think I'm a little bit concerned here where uh, he would have been pushed to get five fantasy points. He would have been pushed to get four fantasy points without his goal and his assist. So that isn't necessarily cash viable to me. I'd rather keep Townsend in the cash and uh, ch try and chase Milicevic in uh, GPP for a, uh, a penalty shot. Uh, potentially, if you want to take him in cash, there's definitely worse options, that's for sure. But of the pair between Milicevic and Townsend, I think I would prefer Townsend just because he's been more consistent throughout the entire season where uh, Milicevic is very uh, up, and go up and down, up and down in terms of uh, his output. So um, there isn't really a lot to look at, at in forwards, and this is a, a lot of the running themes for especially home teams this slate where you're really going to struggle to find 90-minute forwards. And a lot of the targets this slate for 90-minute viable players should be coming from the midfield. So uh, Bashui is pretty interesting in terms of coming in just before the deadline. 7.1K is neat. The problem is he's probably not going to play 90 minutes. Could he eventually in the near future? Absolutely. Is this the slate? Uh, maybe in GPP, very distant GPP uh, flyer. Uh, but I would rather take another wait and see for another week here to see how I feel about it before jumping in at 7K. Uh, and like I said, the, the 90 minutes just aren't there for any of the forwards, so I'm not really necessarily comfortable chasing that quite yet. Um, like I said, he should eventually be the 90-minute guy. Uh, so, yeah, for Crystal Palace, I really like Zaha GPP. Uh, I like Townsend and Cash, and I like Milicevic in either or, though I prefer him in GPP uh, just because I think there's a few better cash options for three to $500 less salary in DraftKings. Uh, but the real place you want to look in this game is defense. Either side doesn't really matter. Take a stand in either side. For the West Ham side, it would definitely have to be a GPP stand. I think... I think you can get away with uh, some Crystal Palace guys in cash, though, chasing some of that def defense production. 
Uh, their home games have just been so low scoring that it's just an instant script that we can buy into. So I'm going to say at best here, a Crystal Palace 2 nothing win. At worst, uh, like a, a 1 nothing Crystal Palace, a 0-0 draw. The worst possible scenario, though, here is that it finishes 0-0 with two goals coming from two players that aren't really DFS relevant, and we lose out on one of the more solid, clean sheet, chaseable games of the slate for really either team. So uh, I'll say one nothing either way, 2 nothing Crystal Palace. Next game on the slate, we have Arsenal traveling to Huddersfield. Now, this should be a super cut and dry, uh, cut and paste, cut and dry, uh, salted scenario, however you want to word it. Arsenal should really win this game. Huddersfield are not only one of the worst teams uh, in league history at this point, but they're easily the league's worst team. They're relegation bound. Uh, they really can't seem to catch a break. One of the bigger concerns for their true results has been their DFS production hasn't really been that bad. So we can at least half assume that they're playing decently enough and they're just not good enough. Uh, they're getting opportunities in and it's just not happening for them. And uh, I don't really expect that to change for Arsenal this, uh, against Arsenal this slate. Now, that being said, on the road, Arsenal has been one of the worst teams in the league at keeping clean sheets. On the road. Uh, and it really hasn't mattered against whom, so I would have to assume at some level here, Huddersfield does get a slight uptick for at least scoring a goal. Uh, will it happen? It's Huddersfield, so it's really hard to say, but at the same time, it's Arsenal. So I, I do think Huddersfield will score a goal this late, so I'm really not interested in the GPP chase. Uh, now, in terms of uh, defensive chase here, I think if uh, Montreal plays on the left-hand side, not a center back, but if, if he's on the left wing, uh, I think he does have some uh, viable upside in GPP. I don't think he has enough floor for cash, uh, but you can probably chase the assist in the, the GPP and uh, try and catch him on some limited ownership. But the, the real issue for me there is that he isn't really looking at a clean sheet, so you're going to need multiple assists. Thankfully, they're going up against Huddersfield, who is exactly that kind of team, to allow a wingback like Montreal to uh, find multiple assists. So I don't hate it. The issue that we have, though, going forward here, though, for Arsenal is minutes. That's the real huge kicker. Uh, whether it's uh, Mkhitaryan, Ramsey could be coming off for each other, one of the other starting. Uh, Zaka isn't 100% healthy. Torreira looks good, but isn't really viable. Huddersfield don't give up a lot of corners, so any kind of the corner free kick chase that we'd have here isn't overly, like again, viable. Um, Awobi should be coming off the field at some point here. So uh, Ganduzi, if he's starting, he should be coming off. If he's not starting, he should be coming on. It's just a whole lot of minutes issues. And while that's not necessarily something to completely ruin these guys, in terms of DFS viable options, we really should be looking for that 90-minute guy, no matter how bad Huddersfield is. And if anything, that for DFS purposes... Uh, gives a little bit more credence to Huddersfield having a little bit more selection viability over Arsenal. Now that definitely doesn't end true come to the final outcome, but it, it's just something to remember as we go forward here. Uh, and even up front, uh, Obs has been uh, sick all week, so it's tough. Like, is this really the 90 minute guy this slate against Huddersfield. Like we really need 90 minutes against Huddersfield because that's, who's going to get all the opportunities. Could he get two goals in 60 minutes? Sure. Why not? But the, it, it, it's just not the, the, the most viable again, to use the term viable of run plays that you can go with where Lacazette should be seeing a, a solid dosage of minutes, especially if OBS can't finish the entire game. Uh, so I, I really don't have an issue with Lacazette in GPP. He'd probably be, it's tough to say this, he'd probably be as far as my Arsenal exposure would go. Uh, I'll probably have some Amabang in GPP, I won't lie. Like, it, you can't, you just can't ignore it going up against Huddersfield. But at the same time, Huddersfield hasn't necessarily been, like, blowout bad all season, especially at home. 
uh, against the teams like Man City and such, yes, like I was saying, against the teams like Man City and such, yes, it can be bad. Uh, but other than that, like th they've done a respectable job keeping scores relatively close, and uh, it isn't something to write home about, obviously. But at the same time, like um, there's nothing to say Arsenal won't win one nothing. Like, and that from that. From those salaries and that scoreline, uh, you're not going to be winning GPPs this late. And on top of that, Arsenal don't really have a plethora, plethora of uh, excellent floor plays. So you're really looking at a situation where you kind of need to get lucky if you're going with Arsenal, even though they're against Huddersfield. And that's speaking strictly from a DFS perspective. When you think about this purely in uh, real life results, it, it's an Arsenal game. There's no question. It's over. It's done. This is another 5 nothing game waiting to happen. But when you look more deeply at the minutes and structure it's more just safely to not play Huddersfield and assume Arsenal is going to score three to four goals from guys that were either like two percent owned to uh, coming off the bench and not being able to be selected at all so yeah we, we can still look at Losal as a low value kind of keeper play if you're looking at Huddersfield not to get blown out and at 4k that's saying a lot like that's really suggesting something they should be 3.8 uh, 3.6k esque and uh, to see him at 4k really says uh, a, a lot uh, that's 3.8 is really where I, I assumed he would be and like that 200 may not that may not mean a lot on face value, but 4K keeper compared to a 3.8 keeper is a massive statement difference. So um, I do think Arsenal can be held low here. I do think Losel does have some relevance, and I do think uh, he can still score six to eight fantasy points. Will it happen? It is very hard to say. Arsenal could come out and score three goals very quickly and just destroy like uh, Chelsea did last slate. But at the same time, yeah, it, Arsenal away are going to concede. Like It's just been the running theme all season. And one of the main people to score for Huddersfield this season has been Zanka Jorgensen. Um, and he leads the team in score in goals scored. It's funny he's actually the league's lowest league's lowest team leading goal scorer with uh, three or four goals. So yeah, it, it's a uh, tough sledding when your center back at three point four k is your leading goal scorer. Uh, does he have relevance? Absolutely. Arsenal have been susceptible by every definition at the back, and it wouldn't surprise me to see him get another header goal this slate. Um, one guy I'm really interested in this slate, honestly, for either format, and I think it's going to be a lot sharper than a lot of people will give credit to, is Aaron Moy at only 6.9K. Um, a few reasons for this. Firstly, Arsenal should concede. I like them to concede on a penalty shot, uh, which will be Aaron Moy's. Uh, I think Arsenal will draw obscene ownership and falter. Uh, just that's my stand. And Aaron Moy is literally the guy for Huddersfield. Like nothing's going to happen. Uh, consistently nothing should happen through Huddersfield. And Moy uh, not being involved would be a, a huge shocker. So yeah, uh, 6.9K, I really don't mind it. Do I think he's going to go out and get double-digit crosses like Milicevic, for example? Uh, no, I don't necessarily see that as being the outcome. Do I see him potentially getting an assist uh, and like 18 fantasy points? Uh, sure, absolutely. Double digits is totally in play this late for me on Aaron Moy and only 6.9K on DraftKings. So uh, I, I really don't mind it. And I, on FanDuel, I don't even mind if you want. It's a little bit. That's a little bit more... Uh, GPP driven for me on FanDuel on DraftKings. I think you can even get away with this in cash. Uh, it, is it my favorite cash option? No, but it's definitely up there. I, I think it's super sharp this slate. I really like Aaron Moy, 6.9K. Uh, the rest of the midfield, though, you can kind of ignore considering Moy is so much better um, on the field and everyone else loses out. Uh, everyone else is much better when Moy isn't on the field to, to contrast that. And, and their forwards I'm really not interested in. Again, there's no solid miss really to chase here. There hasn't been consistently enough all season. Uh, 
yeah, D- Dickaby has been playing it wide a little bit, but coming off the field, he's getting closer to 90 minutes, so I've been paying attention, but he still just hasn't been there yet. And the same can be said for Kachunga, again, comes off the field, uh, but uh, I have to hand him there. He, at least he's seeing some 90 minutes. So maybe uh, Kachunga being uh, the, the one far-off GPP flyer that no one would think of on Huddersfield. Uh, if that's something you're looking for, but I'd rather take uh, Aaron Moy in either format and uh, maybe a little bit of Zanka in a GPP and try and catch uh, a set piece. Now, yeah, it's tough. Lo, Lo could see some set pieces, and if he catches a few from his salary, he could be very interesting. Uh, but that's really where. Again, Hadagajong's doing his normal Hadagajong thing where he costs uh, less than, or he's a little bit more expensive now. He used to be le- cost less than 4K and finishes around 7. So, yeah, it's uh, it's tough to side with those guys over Zanka's goal upside. Uh, so I'd rather just stick with Aaron Moy in either format, Zanka in GPP, and on, and on Arsenal. Um, obviously, uh, I'll have some OBS in GPP, some, a little bit more Lacazette, over OBS uh, and uh, some Montreal in uh, GPP if he's on the left hand side. Final score 1 0 Arsenal, uh, maybe 2 1 Arsenal, uh, but what I'm really hoping for and shooting for this slate would be either a 1 1 draw or a 1 0 Huddersfield win. I think that would really, uh, really ch- dramatically change the day. Next game on the slate, we have Bournemouth traveling to Liverpool. And this is another really cut and dry game. Bournemouth have been absolutely brutal away from home this season. They've been brutal in general. They've lost 10 of their last 15 games. Um, It's just really not the team you want to go up against Liverpool. Now, that being said, if there's one thing we can look at right now, it's that Liverpool are really letting it slip. Uh, They are falling apart. They... They, there's something that we can consider now because they're still going to draw the same amount of ownership that they've been drawing when they were uh, undefeated forever and ever. Amen. Very quickly about Bournemouth, though, I don't think there's much defensively to target. They're probably going to let in a goal or two. It's about them being able to reply with a goal or two. Um, if they keep this under two goals... I, I just still don't like Bork. I prefer Losel over Bork if you're going to go for, or Baruch, excuse me, if you're going to go for the uh, value keeper role this slate, uh, just because Liverpool has a lot more upside. Now, that being said, Liverpool has been very poor as of late, and Bournemouth, both teams are really hurt. Both teams are really hurt. That's the easy way to put it. Klein won't be playing because he's actually owned by Liverpool and on loan to Bournemouth, so he won't be able to play. Uh, So they'll be very weak on the right back, which should allow Sadio Mane to have an exceptionally good game, who I'm targeting this late, and I'll get to in a moment. Um, Ryan Frazier from 6.6K. He's been doing excellent as of late. I think he has GP, GPP relevance, especially from the salary. But in terms of cash, his floor should take a significant enough hit that it makes it less reliable for cash and just not something that I'm overly looking to chase. But for GPP, absolutely go after him. Uh, there's no reason why not. If you catch an assist off him, you, you, you'll be flying. Uh, and basically, the thing is, Josh King is... Bournemouth only forward. Uh, that's re- he really shouldn't be coming off the field by all definitions. So, if you're looking for some place to target Liverpool, it's actually really easy to target this slate. I'll say it that way. Um, is it necessarily a good idea to target Liverpool? No, but compared to other weeks, a target is a little bit more viable to go after this slate maybe than other slates. Um, because frankly, yeah, Liverpool just hasn't been as good at as of late as we not only expect, but their ownership and salaries demand. And a lot of that has to do with the amount of goals they've been conceding. Uh, three straight, not really something you want to be doing against teams like Crystal Palace, Leicester, and West Ham uh, at home and away. Um hasn't won in back-to-back games like it's not necessarily panic time or anything like that but Liverpool are showing that at this point of the season it's starting to trend the other direction a little bit and a lot of this too has to do with this 
this midweek they they host Bayern Munich on Tuesday in the Champions League, which is absolutely massive. So it really wouldn't surprise me to see them looking past this already. If I was to, like I mentioned earlier, if I was to side with one of the other, it's definitely the Huddersfield side that I would go with in terms of the better value. Uh, but I, I do think Liverpool holds just as much risk as Arsenal does, and the masses do will not consider the risk whatsoever. They'll just be locking in on Liverpool Arsenal stacks and hoping for the best. And while I see Liverpool probably doing a little bit better, scoring probably three goals, um, their ownership and salaries demand at least five. Uh, so if we slim down our selections and player pools from Liverpool, we can probably pivot off uh, the huge ownerships onto something more and go over the field. And as I was mentioning earlier, my guy this slate for that will be uh, Sadio Mane. He scored the vast majority of his goals at home this season. Uh, he's got the most consistent 90 minutes outside of Salah. If, in fact, Liverpool start going ham, it really wouldn't surprise me to see Salah come off first and Mane stay on the field. Uh, I also really like uh, Robertson. If Alexander-Arnold is still out, Liverpool is compromising. And they're just not good at compromising. And this is why they've done so poorly over the past few games. They've been hurt at the back and in the midfield. So they've been kind of filling in roles with James Milner playing wing back. And things just not working out. Fabinho playing center back. It's been rough sledding. So if Alexander Arnold is back, I like Liverpool more. But I still don't like his 6.3k where you can easily take far more reliable and better options uh, on different teams uh, for the same type of salary. If you're going to play a Liverpool defender, just roll with Andrew Robertson. Uh, in either format, you can get away with him stacking him with Mane going on the left-hand side. You can get away with taking him by himself in cash and just hoping for six-plus fantasy points and maybe a clean sheet. You can take him in GPP with Allison as a stack and hope for the clean sheet chase. You can take him just by himself in GPP and hope he gets an assist and a clean sheet by himself. Uh, there, there's just lots of different ways you can go about this because there's a really good possibility Bournemouth don't even get a shot on that. Uh, that's always relevant. So if you're really looking for two places to go, I think a lot of people this slate will go on the right-hand side with their ownership with Salah and Trent Alexander-Arnold, and I'm pivoted to the other side of the field, and I'm going to the left-hand side of the field with uh, uh, the, the Robertson and Sadio Mane. Uh, now, is that to say Salah's a bad player or something like that? No, absolutely not. He's still fine. You can still use him in either format. It's just I like Mane for GPP more, and I like Robertson for either format more. Um, that's just how I, I level my Liverpool players this slate. That, that's probably the three I'll be focusing on in terms of my exposure. Uh, so... Yeah, if you want to go Josh King, I wouldn't talk you out of it in GPP. It's definitely not a cash viable uh, run. The same with uh, Frazier and Josh King. If you connect with those two on one goal, you're set. Because not only are you getting points from them scoring, but the amount of Liverpool ownership that loses not only direct points with Allison, but the implied points of the clean sheets, you're really making tons and tons and tons of ground in GPP. Tons of ground because the other side is so highly owned. Uh, so yeah, I uh, I really like Liverpool, the left-hand side. 3-1 final score, Liverpool wins. Next game on the slate, we have Cardiff traveling to Southampton. Uh, really interesting game once more, but another home team that just, just doesn't jump off the page. Now, I think a lot of this is my self-bias. I'll call it right now to everyone. It's very hard for me to say yay Southampton because they've burned me for multiple years. But Cardiff is borderline relegation bound. Away from home, they're far worse than they are uh, at home. It, there is relevance to be found here. I definitely would look for it defensively. Uh, maybe if you want to take Joe Bennett in cash, I think you can get away with that 3.7K. Uh, he's doing what Cunningham does, for, but for a little bit cheaper. Uh, not as good, but uh, if you really are desperate for a sub 4K guy who's not going to finish zero and somewhere around six fantasy points, uh, Joe Bennett's definitely in play for 3.7K. 
Um, but the further forward you go, it, it's tough. Like if Camaras is out again, I definitely like Joe Rawls and only 3.9 K for cash. I would roll with them uh, too much in GPP because you're still really only going to get single digits, but it should be on the higher end of single digits, probably around nine to 9.5 fancy points. Uh, that's if Camaras is out. Uh, now outside of that, again, we have minutes issues where, um, Hoylet hasn't really been relevant enough and hasn't been seeing enough minutes. Uh, Bobby Reed keeps popping up and scoring goals, but gets taken off the field at really inopportune moments. Uh, it's really tough, right? Like, you want to jump on these guys, but none of them really seem to hold any kind of 90 minute relevance. Uh, Patterson is still drawing interest. To me, from me, from slate to slate to slate, he's playing on the left hand side. He's doing a lot more things than he was in the past, and he's still priced like he was playing as kind of a, a shadow nine center uh, attacking midfielder and not doing much DFS wise. 5.4k is far from my favorite salary this slate. I'd rather just take the chance and Joe Rawls in general uh, and go with him in cash. Uh, even in GPP, I would prefer Joe Rawls over Patterson. Uh, but I do think uh, Patterson does hold some GPP relevance. Uh, and uh, up front again, it, it's just a, a minute a wash of bad minutes. Uh, Niasi, nowhere close to 90 minutes. So yeah, it's it's just not where you want to look this slate. And not only that, they're not a very good team. So it kind of lends already to the idea that we can fade Cardiff. Not necessarily as a whole, but as a ceiling. And, uh, and that lends itself again to Southampton getting a leg up here and potentially doing some serious damage to this slate. Uh, McCarthy... I don't want to say he's my favorite keeper play of the slate. He's definitely one of my top three favorites. Uh, I think he has incredible uh, stacking clean sheet runs with either Target and maybe Valerie gets to start out on the right-hand side. But I think Target's viable for either format this slate. Chase that clean sheet, see if you can get a hold of it. Uh, it could really work out. Um, now, let's see. Th this is really where... If you remember earlier back in the video where I was speaking about the home side midfield, this is really where it drives home, where Southampton have some of the best options this entire slate, whether it's uh, Ward Prowse and Cash at 8.3K. Uh, probably one of my favorite plays this slate. The issue with Ward Prowse is that he isn't always guaranteed to start. It looks like under the new manager, he, he's getting the full lock status, which is great. I have no issue with him in either format. Um... You can roll with Holberg if you're looking to take a little bit of a discount and he gets the start too. He's always a good chance for double digits and only 6.3k in DraftKings. I also really like him in FanDuel. He has excellent defensive peripherals uh, and he always has a tiny bit of upside. But uh, I definitely prefer Ward Prowse in this scenario. And uh, Redmond's another guy who's getting lots of minutes. Is he my favorite option? Absolutely not. Uh, but is he doing things and getting minutes? Yes, and if you're looking for something this game uh, on a home favorite, uh, 6K is not that big of an ask uh, for someone like Nathan Redmond. But I think Ward Prost makes one of the better plays this slate. You're going to want to get him into your cash, especially uh, either format, though. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's where I'm thinking uh, in terms of... The, the main issue with the yeah, other forwards aren't playing 90 minutes, so we can avoid that. The main issue with Southampton is that they draw a lot. And in the past couple of seasons, that's really what they did. They draw, they drew all sorts of games and then won a few and did really well at not losing. And then to start this season, it was a contrast to that where they were doing really well at not winning, just losing lots of games and still drawing a fair amount. And they weren't seeing that same kind of upside. And I don't expect Southampton to completely change their fortunes. They should revert back now to their drawing and winning a little bit rather than drawing and losing a lot more. Uh, so, yeah, is McCarthy viable? Sure. Uh Definitely not my favorite, but uh, Ward, Prowse, and Target are two of my more favorited plays of this slate. Uh, in terms of the final score, I think Southampton could score a couple here. 2 nothing Southampton. Uh, maybe Cardiff scores one, but uh, I see Southampton winning by two goals this slate. Next game, we have Everton traveling to Watford. Really evenly matched game. Um, two teams... Normally, a lot of people will look at this and say they're going to cancel out, and I beg to differ. I think this is going to be a four to five goal total game, um, 
but it's going to be a lot of back and forth, and it's going to be tough to figure out where these goals are going to come from. Starting with Everton, I do think Everton can win this game. I do think Pickford can do well, but he's probably going to concede because Everton aren't that great, and he just hasn't been consistent enough in doing so with clean sheets. Uh, Digne is someone I think you can go with in either format. 6.8K, you can't go wrong. Um, is he my favorite cash option? No, uh, but I think he's borderline necessary in cash just to make sure that you don't miss out in case everyone else has him, which is always the situation uh, with someone uh, with the, the consistent floor like Digne. Um, Sigurdsson. What do you want to do? That's that's the, really the question this slate, is what do you want to do with Sigurdsson? Um, Watford have been allowing a ton of crosses. Sigurdsson has an excellent floor. You really can't go wrong here. But once you start doing this, you're, you're limiting yourself to what else you can take, in particular any kind of Liverpool upside. Uh or any kind of salary upside from here on out because you're more, more than likely going to put Sigurdsson as a forward. Uh, so yeah, let's do that now. Um, so yeah, if uh, the the other side of this too is that Watford and Everton both cross the ball like madmen, and both center backs should see a massive uptick. I prefer to go with the Everton center backs because I think they have a better chance at the clean sheet. Uh, so it, it's tough. Coleman's price keeps going down, and I know he's better than his salary, but his production just hasn't been there. Uh, so that does make Pickford a little bit more interesting to me, getting both Digne and uh, Coleman and um, Pickford, Digne and Coleman, sorry, and trying to get the trio all together as one. Uh, but in terms of a, a real place to look, it's for me it's going to be floor in this game, and I don't see Watford having a lot of floor. So I'm going to chase the last Sigurdsson, maybe take a little bit of Richardson and GPP. The issue for me is that Watford don't allow a lot of shots, uh, especially from the midfield. So if it's coming anywhere from this game, I see the, this coming from set pieces and crosses, uh, namely Digne and Sigurdsson. So getting both of them into your cash or, or as a GPP stack, I think is really sharp again this slate. Uh, as it is most slates, but uh, especially against a team like Watford, these guys are just so hard to predict. It, it's frustrating. Uh, Holobos, again, is just not owning up to his salary. He's starting to convert into like a defensive minded peripheral player. Jan Matt's picking up on the crossing count, uh, but he still isn't doing enough to really warrant 5.1K in a game where they'll be really fortunate to get a clean sheet. And if you're looking to chase a clean sheet, I don't mind going Foster and Jan Matt, but I would really fade Holobos simply for the fact when you take that high of a salary in defense, you're really scripting yourself down to very straight. Uh, line of what players you can take and it's almost unnecessary with someone like Holobos in either format because he's always going to take fouls no matter what and it, like maybe maybe cleverly in GPP I've been on him a little bit um, he hasn't worked out that's safe to say but he is getting better and he is a world class player he was just injured for most of the season so he's still coming back to form so I don't mind cleverly if you fall onto that and as always, Troy Deeney's going to take the penalty shots and probably play 90 minutes. Everton's done crazier things than concede a penalty shot. So, uh, yeah, it really wouldn't surprise me to see Deeney get on a GPP score sheet uh, this slate. Uh, I think game stacking is 100% in play here, taking some Deeney and Sigerson with uh, maybe some, uh, excuse me, maybe even some uh, Dingye at the same time as well and hoping to catch uh, just a really high set piece floor or goal off set piece. But the center backs, just don't sleep on the center backs from this game, especially in FanDuel. If you're playing FanDuel, make sure to get Watford and Everton center backs into your game, uh, into your lineups, excuse me, because they're going to be dealing with uh, exorbitant amount of crosses, uh, especially the Everton side who should see uh, a ton. So, uh, and the def and defend far more effectively. Uh, so a final score for me uh, this game. 
I'll probably say uh, 3-2 Everton, maybe even something crazy like a 4-2 or 4-1 Everton. I just don't see this finishing under three goals. So if it's uh, two, uh, anything, anything less than 2-1, I'll be very surprised. If it's going to be a winner, I think Everton. But just for the sake of recent history, Everton are coming into this as one of the coldest teams in the league. And Watford is coming into this as one of the consistent drawing teams in the league. So let's say a 2-2 final score here. And uh, both teams have a center back goal. Let's, let's say that to be really risky. Final game of the slate. We have a really ugly, uh, really ugly late hammer with Burnley making the trip all the way up north. Uh, from up north, excuse me, down south to play Brighton. Uh, this is tough. Um, I think it's funny that Brighton are so expensive, especially defensively, where someone like Matt Ryan has just as much likelihood to give you a negative score than come anywhere close to double digits. Uh, so I'm really not interested in Matt Ryan. Tom Heaton continues to be one of the better goalkeepers in the league. Now, here's my... Here's my issue. If you haven't been following my content, basically for the past six games, Tom Heaton has come back. He was the World Cup goaltender for England before he got hurt. Uh, so he is legitimate. He's world class. Burnley have been hanging on by a thread for the past few games. And this is literally about to snap. This can't continue. Um, they've been playing well out of their merit for the past six games in all reality and been riding the Tom Heaton wave. He's more than good enough, especially from 4.2K, especially against a team like Brighton, who at the moment are playing incredibly poor. Uh, so I really don't mind Tom Heaton, 4.2K, either format. The issue with GPP is that he doesn't really have stacking uh, options. Barsley and Taylor, their salaries are right, but their upside is never there. And if you're stacking them outside of cash, uh, you, maybe you can try and see. You can't chase a GPP or you can't chase a clean sheet in cash because that's not a viable cash script. But at the same time, you can't really catch much in cash with a stack of Taylor and Heaton or Barsley and Heaton without a clean sheet. And you kind of need to luck into that. And it's just like, that's just not cash, a cash chase and they don't have a ceiling. So it's tough. Maybe if you want to take a Burnley center back, uh, I think that is half interesting. Uh, Glenn Murray's obviously a big target for them. So there's going to be lots of work. Uh, for me, this slate, a lot of the slate depends on how Johan Berg Goodmanson uh, starts to do his thing. Um, that's really it. Like, if he gets to start, I really have no issue with him in cash. I think he's from 7.3K, he's borderline cash viable. I, I said this last slate, he was my favorite player in the slate. He didn't even uh, end up starting or playing. So, it's a big concern for me. A lot of this is twofold. First, I know. JBG's good enough. I know his salary is too cheap and he'll have tons of crossing opportunity. Secondly, I know Dwight McNeil's too expensive, isn't going to have the mint, and at this point is old news and going to draw tons of ownership. So it's just there's a lot more reasons to join the JBD, JBG train at this point now and leave the Dwight McNeil, uh, especially if McNeil isn't seeing the minutes. Uh, if JBG doesn't start again, it's tough. I really wouldn't mind some Robbie Brady if I knew he was going to see some solid minutes. But again, that's falling off. Uh, so I, a lot of this rests on Ashley Burns uh, getting solid minutes once again in GPP. I wouldn't venture it in cash, but uh, Chris Wood isn't seeing 90 minutes as much anymore. So if you're going to go anywhere with Burnley and you expect them to score more than a goal, Ashley Burns is a really good viable option from 7.7K on DraftKings. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the cash, I think uh, Johan, if he's playing at 7.3K, is incredibly important. Uh, but so is Tom Heaton, maybe even more so. Uh, but then when you get to this point, you, you do have to find a forward for that kind of a cheaper salary. And that it's it is uh, easier said than done I guess is a way to put it maybe you could get away with a little bit of Patterson uh, but anyways 
Point being, at this moment, Burnley, Tom Heaton, you can continue to roll with him at only 4.2k. Very simply, he's just better than that. And uh, finally, to finish it off here, we have Brighton, the home side. Brighton has literally stayed up the past couple seasons on their home results. They do incredibly well at home and play horrible away from home. They've only lost three home games this season. They're 12 home games. So they've, they've been holding that true. The issue is that they've just been garbage the past few weeks. Uh, absolutely brutal. Non-viable. Um, the Fulham game was interesting enough, except they got pounded. And if it wasn't for Glenn Murray, they really wouldn't have found anything. So, yeah, it, it they're going to let in goals. That's really the big point here. Um, and Burnley can score. It's just it's a matter of finding the viable options. And that's why I like Johan berg Goodmanson so much because his chance creation and crossing is going to be so high. Um, now, the same defensive idea can be said for Brighton here. They're going to see a ton of crosses. So uh, don't be afraid to roll some dunk uh, or some Duffy, especially in FanDuel. Um, one person that I can't shake, uh, every slate, it feels like, feels like I'm trying to forget this guy is around and I don't want to play him. It's Solly March. Every single slate, he just keeps popping up at 6.1K. Flirts with double digits. Um, yeah, it, it's, he's even cash viable. That's the thing. He has an excellent floor. Uh, he isn't necessarily a, a massive role player. But he's just a very active, a very active DFS type of player. Quick, crosses a lot, uh, not uh, not slow on the ball. So, yeah, it, it, the real again, too, is like, I like Solly March, but Pascal Grobe. And you kind of have to take a stand between either Burnley or Brighton and say it's going to be either Pascal Grobe or Johan Berg Goodmanson. It's going to be Ashley Burns or Glenn Murray. It's going to be Solly March or... Or Robbie Brady. Do you, do you understand what I mean there? It, like even I'm not interested in the Brighton defense of Chase at all. But you could just as simply say uh, the Bong and the Bardsley and the Taylor are all the same boat, which they are. So, yeah, it, it's uh, it's a one way or another here. I obviously I like Keaton a lot more, so I don't really have to explain which side I like. But, but this is a big but. If you're taking Grobe, you can't take Heaton. Take Losel. If you're not taking Grobe, uh, take uh, Heaton and uh, use Losel and maybe another uh, cash card or a different uh, different type of uh, GPP uh, script. I want to say a one nothing Burnley win. Uh, probably rather boring game. And outside of Tom Heaton, I'm really not going to venture too deeply. It's tough with someone like. Yo, Johan berg not being guaranteed minutes at the moment. Um, so I do want to play him, but at the same time, it, it, it's a heavy risk because you can't just switch to taking Matt Ryan and Pascal Grove because Ryan is not a viable cash keeper. Uh, it's just not on. So GPP, go wild. I can't talk yet of it. Uh, Burnley are waiting to lose. Uh, it's bound to come here shortly. So final score, I'll say one nothing either way. I do like it to be Burnley, though. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, rotopros.com get over check us out articles top right hand corner click on it, drop down uh, all of it's free uh, 30 day free trial on the go right now sign up get in our slack get uh, get talking to us um, rad rob diamond sir robert six on all the main sites make sure to check me out on twitter the rad rob diamond so thank you very much everyone uh, take care hopefully see some of you at the top leaderboards maybe even qualify for a king of the pitch this slate good luck take care